Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hope everyone's doing okay. I thought, uh, well, anyways, I want to say a couple things. Um, first of which is that uh, I was a little behind in writing a solution set for homework five, and in doing so, I realized on the second to last question, I think that's question seven, uh, you need to assume that the temperature of the ionized gas is 8,000 Kelvin, like in the problem right after it. Uh, so I've uploaded a slightly edited um, version that has a couple trivial typos corrected and includes that one additional assumption, which will uh, make it possible. If you have any questions about that, of course, hit us up on homework discussion. and. Don't be shy about um, putting questions in there. It's there for you to discuss uh, uh, things. And if you're hitting issues, uh, just post into the Discord. Sending mes me a message will generally lead to me wanting to go ahead and post it to the Discord. So yeah, save a step. Uh, I think that's the only big issue that popped up. Uh, the other thing that I want to say is that as we're uh, coming up, we have a homework uh five due to, uh, on friday and then nothing for reading break and then the following week we'll have homework six uh that will cover the ism stuff and it will showcase some of the gaia stuff that we did on friday and i'm going to wrap up today so are there any questions before we get going today I know folks showed up uh, a little later than usual. I, was there a midterm or something right before this in some other uh, class? I don't know. Uh, will we be in person after reading week? Yes, uh, our U of A classes are back in person after reading week. So we will be there. I am going to try to keep making lecture videos. Uh, I've got half of a class laid down on YouTube. I will try to get the other half down. Uh, because we will be in person, uh, we will not have my gorgeous uh, podcasting or whatever setup I have uh, here. Uh, so the quality of the content will probably decline, but I will continue to make things accessible. Uh, and no more doggo too. Yeah, that's a sad. That, that all, all these things are a little bit on the uh, sadder side. But on the upside, we'll be able to do some of the activities that I wanted to do that kind of uh, work better in class than uh, clearly they do over the internet. Uh, so hopefully that will be a potato potato. Uh, I'll stress that if you can't make it back to Edmonton, uh, if we can't make it back to Edmonton, uh, for the class as a whole, you'll be able to basically complete everything but the final exam because uh, the ACE clause, all your participation marks and stuff will be overwritten. Uh, so, you know, if you want to stay remote for this class and then just come to Edmonton for the final, that's a totally legitimate way of dealing with the grading structure of the class. We also, what are the odds a strike will kick in after we go back in person? That is so far above my pay grade, it's not even funny. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am not involved in those probabilities. I'm just gonna say that uh, if things rely upon the provincial government and the upper administration collectively uh, sort of, you know, finding in their sense reason, uh, then I think we have a good chance of avoiding a strike. Uh, so yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely possible to avoid a strike. Uh, yeah, so I mean, these are non-ideal circumstances. So uh, other questions? I mean, I have so much to say about labor relations, but you are literally not paying $20 a class to hear me talk about it. You're hearing me talk about the interstellar medium. So, ah, yeah. Without further ado, let's wrap up by going into, oops, go away, go away, everybody. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the last thing that I didn't get to say about glue. Uh, and the last thing on glue was uh, I wanted to show you something to calculate uh, properties of the galactic disk and stuff. So we set things up last time where I showed you how we can calculate the color corrected HR diagram from uh, take out the effects of dust in using the information in the Gaia data. I showed you how to convert that. Uh, oh, don't give me spinning wheel of death. All right, come on, wakey, wakey. Uh, yeah, huh. Adding vectors may be slow. 
Anyways, uh, I showed you how to collect a three-dimensional data set uh, and, uh, oh yeah, and spin it around. So what I have here is basically a slice in the galaxy. I've taken a one kiloparsec cylinder of stars around the sun. Uh, I've put it into a three-dimensional diagram here. Uh, that's not, uh, okay, it's woken up and reallocated resources. So this is just the cylinder of stars around uh, the sun. Uh, we have our Hertzsprung-Russell diagram corresponding to those, and then a vertical distribution of stars plotted on a logarithm on the y-axis. And uh, the last thing I wanted to do is sort of show you some quantification. So the thickness of the stellar disk uh, as a function of stellar type, because it's telling us something about the stars. Last time we left with this observation, which is if I look at where the main sequence luminous stars are, if I look at where the main sequence luminous stars are, uh, in the cylinder, they tended to be concentrated around the center of uh, the disk. If I look at the giants, they're kind of scattered over a much larger uh, scale height. And then these little notches here are because of dust extinction. Uh, and then what I can do is take those subsets uh, here, bink, Let's say I want to calculate uh, the height of those stars. I can take that subset and drop it. So laggy today. Take the subset and drop it into uh, this histogram. And it shows the sort of spread of the different stars. And then if I come back and I define a main sequence section, that's supposed to get, yeah, give me another uh, stuff. So bright mean sequence stars, I can also drop that in here. And the point I want to get at is that this is a narrower distribution. So we see the vertical distribution of the giants is thicker than the vertical distribution of the main sequence stars. So what's neat about that is we can actually quantify that a bit uh, in glue. So those aficionados of you in Python uh, can do this. And I can take a subset in my menu over here and drop it into the terminal. And I'll say, what do you want to call that? And I'll call that main sequence uh, here. And then if I, then I end up with main sequence defined over here as a result. And I can take main sequence and ask for the uh, zgal property of it. And that tells me the vertical position of all the stars on the main sequence here. And if I want to calculate the thickness of that, uh, I forget if NumPy is unloaded. It is not. I can import NumPy as NP, and I can ask what the standard deviation of the main sequence stars in zgal is. And that tells me it's, OK, with this thickness, it's about 449 parsecs. And then I can do the same thing with the giants. Drop the giants in. Let's say these are giants. And then I can ask what the standard deviation of the main sequence of the giants are. Oop, nope, nope, nope. Sorry, I did that wrong. Main sequence of giants in the zgal direction. And it'll tell me that I have a syntax error. That's 529 parsecs. So what this is really telling me is the thickness of the, uh, uh, the scales of the galaxy. And we see that these giant stars are kind of distributed over a larger vertical area. We literally measured it right here uh, than the uh, recently formed stars in the main sequence. So this is a lead in to our study of galactic dynamics. Why are the giants uh, spread more vertically than the uh, main sequence stars. What is it about the galaxy that is leading to this distribution of stars and to this weird kind of Gaussian in the middle, exponential on the wings uh, uh, thickness of the galaxy uh, that we're measuring here? So we'd like to try to understand these properties as we go forward. Okay. That's what I want to say about Gaia and show you how to just use the terminal here with selected subsets of the data uh, to make these neat little measurements here. Any uh, questions on that?
right. Okay, changing gears to uh, here. Yeah, let's go over here. Uh, so this is, uh, so when last we spoke, we were studying basically how long it would take for recombination to occur uh, using this kind of simple model of the recombination coefficient at uh, 10,000 Kelvin. And we had wrapped up this notion of what is an ionized region, what sets the balance of the ionized region, and uh, then, yeah, what sets the balance of the ionized region, what's the structure. And this is totally a toy model. So the Stromgren sphere model about photoionized regions, nothing looks like that in the interstellar medium. Some stuff get close, but nothing really looks like that. And so why is this important? And I've selected this of just one of three case studies uh, of the interstellar medium. And the main reason I brought this in is that the this showcases the role of the interstellar medium at reprocessing radiation. Uh, and so what was the net effect of this big blob of gas sitting around this ionizing star is that we are turning the photons of that star into other photons. So we're basically changing the emergent light. And this is important because when we're observing galaxies and we're studying the light from galaxies, the emission that we see has been reprocessed uh, through the interstellar medium. And we have to understand what the properties of the ISM mean about or what the properties of the emission lines mean through uh, the sort of filter of the interstellar medium about what the underlying stars are doing. And we have that capacity and actually tells us, you know, we get bonus. We learn a lot about the IS, uh, a lot about galaxies by understanding what the ISM structure. So uh, we can ask, what are the fates of photons uh, that are coming out of one of these ionizing stars, uh, of, the, uh, an ion, uh, of these photons that are coming out of these stars? Uh, so anything that is in uh, what we call the Lyman continuum, so basically that's our cool astro way of saying uh, things with photon energies that are larger than 13.6 eV, those will just straight up ionize neutral atoms that are sitting in the ground state. They're, they sail out, they find a neutral atom somewhere in the H2 region, poof, knock off the electron, ionized. Um, and then after, uh, basic, and then what happens is any photon that is, or any electron that's sort of whizzing around and then recombines with the hydrogen atom, if it recombines to n greater than one, the net effect of this whole process has been to take a photon that's in the ionizing Lyman continuum and turn it, break it up into smaller photons or smaller energy photons. They are longer wavelengths, so I guess they're technically bigger, but be that as it may. Uh, they, we're basically breaking up ionizing photons into smaller energy photons. So that's uh, the main uh, effort there. Anything that's kind of Lyman beta or greater, uh, when it's absorbed, it could drop all the way to the Lyman, uh, uh, ba basically the n equals one line. So when I'm talking about Lyman beta, I'm talking about a photon like this. Lyman beta drops down uh, like that. And if I have a Lyman beta photon, it de-excites and it goes along and it finds another neutral photon somewhere. It will collide with that, or sorry, this you gotta say the right words for this lecture to make sense. Okay, so if a Lyman beta photon gets emitted with an electron d excites from the n equals three to the n equals one state, it'll fly through the H2 region, find a neutral hydrogen atom in the n equals one state, and then just excite it back up to n equals three. So you basically, you switch which, which atoms are in the n equals three state. But you always have a chance in that n equals three state to d excite uh, from n equals three down to n equals two instead of all the way back to n equals one. And that's uh, the effect of putting the photon and breaking it up into the Balmer series. So basically anything in this Lyman beta, Lyman gamma, any of these Lyman series photons has a chance to go into a different photon series uh, here. And then this essentially takes something out of the Lyman series and puts it into another uh, a photon series, except for everything will eventually kind of cascade into the state where you get an n equals 2 to n equals 1 transition, and that gives you the, uh, that gives you 
a Lyman alpha photon. So Lyman alpha photons are somewhat unique because they can't be broken up through the hydrogen atom level structure into other photons. So they just kind of rattle around till they get to the edge of the uh, H2 region and sort of keep sort of leaking their way through the interstellar medium. Uh, kind of exciting and de-exciting, never to ever be broken into another photon. And then the Balmer series, the Passion series, all those photons very happily just kind of drift out of the H2 region uh, without any substantial absorption. So they are essentially taking energy out. And so the net effect of all this is we've taken ionizing photons and we turn them into Lyman alpha photons and then a bunch of other photons in ba uh, Balmer, Passion, Bracket, Fund, all the other hydrogen uh, series. So that's what we mean by it's reprocessing the radiation here. Um, and yeah, so I think that's the main point I, I had on that. Um, other questions? Any questions? Take it away. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so the convention is always that you start out with like, uh, you know, so all the photon series are named by where they end up. So Lyman just means it ends up in the ground state. And so when you say that the gamma uh, comes up, that just means that it is uh, two levels higher than the Lyman alpha photon. So if the Lyman alpha is two to one, you go up two levels, it's got to be four to one is line, oh, that's this one's Lyman gamma uh, there. So that's, uh, that's what we mean is that so, the name of the series is where you end up, and then the Greek letter is which uh, which of the steps, starting at alpha, uh, moving up from the you know plus one above where you end up. So uh, one to two is Lyman alpha. Uh, one to three would be the Lyman beta photon. So I I think I was getting at what you were asking, but let me do, does that is that addressing your question? Oh, there are definitely cases beyond the gamma. I just, because the levels get really crunchy and my handwriting is terrible, I didn't write them in. Uh, so this one here is, this is Lyman Delta unlabeled. And then Lyman Epsilon is this one. All the way down. So yeah, it just keeps going. And then Eventually, once you get up to the top level being like a double digit level, uh, they usually just convert to numbers uh, like Lyman 13 or something like that. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's the convention. We usually only talk about the first few levels of any given series anyways, so it's not too clunky of a notation. Yeah. So in theory, it can go to in you know infinite. Uh, infinitely close to the ground state. And indeed, in a lot of radio astronomy, this is a sidebar, but something that excites me, uh, you can actually get a lot of these transitions happening up here between these high end lines in the radio, which are like the N equals 87 to N equals 88 line of the hydrogen atom. And so then that doesn't really have a series, but you often see like H87 alpha, that's the 88 to 87 line of uh, this. And it, it shows up in H2 region spectra uh, using radio telescopes. All right. Set things up. I can't see at all. All right. Cool, cool. Thanks for the question. I love a good question. Okay. Uh, with this case study, I kind of wanted to say, okay, and so the same kind of physics applies in other situations. And one of the places where that uh, other kind of physics applies is in the reprocessing of radiation with dust. So we really focused so far on dust doing the absorption of starlight, but it, uh, as you're starting to explore in homework set five, it also then re-radiates that light into other, um, it radiates that light into other wavelengths, predominantly in the infrared. So 
Dust grains have a size. Oh, 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 geez. Don't look at that. You'll see it later. Uh, dust grains have a size distribution. So this is like the IMF, but for dust grains, it's this differential size distribution, which basically shows the number of dust grains found in an interval of radius, uh, grain radius. And this just means that R is e R to the negative 3.5. That just means that the dust grains are declining size distribution. There are lots of dust grains with small radii, and there are very few dust grains with large radii. And this is deeper than the IMF. So so, you know, which is minus 2.35 in kind of similar uh, notation. So this means that they are really like quite a steep uh, uh, distribution. Very few uh, big dust grains here. And I've tried to illustrate that using terrible PowerPoint math, uh, terrible PowerPoint slides right here. Uh, so, uh, and what this means is that uh, given the dis distribution, almost all of the mass in dust is sitting in the big dust grains because the mass goes basically like the radius cubed because that's the volume of the dust grain. They all have a similar uh, density. Uh, and most of the absorption is coming from small dust grains because that goes like the cross section or R squared. Uh, and so uh, this leads uh, to basically what the small dust grains are doing are really affecting what the optics and the radiation is doing. And I make this statement here that the cross section is proportional to uh, one over wavelength uh, squared for wavelength larger than the radius. But I actually, I found this wonderful figure from, oops, this is uh, like, it was literally published on the archive like when I was writing this lecture. Uh, and I was like, oh, Yes, thank you very much, Frederick. I will take this wonderful figure that you've made, uh, which is um, uh, Frederick Galliano. Uh, it's Frederick uh, Galliano. Uh, is this you know a wonderful ISM dust theorist, uh, one of the people who actually builds models of dust in the ISM, and had to basically write his, uh, his tenure and promotion thesis. Uh, in France, and uh, came up with this really neat figure and very nicely licensed it under Creative Commons by Shared uh, uh, Share Alike. So uh, yeah, that means I can actually use it in these videos, which is fantastic. Uh, so what happens here is this is showing you the effect of the optical properties of dust grains in three different wavelength regimes. Uh, in the short uh, or in the very small wavelength regime, uh, so over here, this is the case where the wavelength of the light is much, much smaller than the dust grain uh, size. Then it just acts like a, uh, basically a target. It's, and so it follows the geometric cross-section of pi r squared. And so this line up here is basically the effective area of a dust grain as a function of wavelength where one here corresponds to the geometric area. So that is pi uh, r squared is uh, the dust grain. And then this graph kind of reads across and what it's showing you is two different uh, curves. In the red curve, it is the behavior of the absorption of the dust grains. So that's how it catches light, reprocesses it, and re-radiates it. And then the blue curve is showing the optical properties of a dust grain uh, as it undergoes scattering. And so we talked about how uh, there's this pi r squared, which is basically geometric optics. You're firing a bullet at a target and it hits it. That's kind of like the watermelon example that I did in class is this sort of geometric pi r squared optics. But once we get to this case where the wavelength of the light is about the size of a dust grain, we enter into this me scattering regime, me uh, scattering regime, and then the optical properties change and we start getting these weird kind of resonance structures where you get like multiple like resonance uh, features where an electromagnetic wave is driving a charge response which then feeds back into the um, uh, into the electromagnetic wave. And it leads to this asymmetric scattering properties of dust grains. So a photon will come in and it will preferentially be kind of forward scattered uh, and, you know, uh, rarely back scattered. And then the uh, cross section starts to change. It can get a little bit bigger 
uh, here in this part right here gets a little bit larger than geometric for scattering uh, and then it changes off uh, it trades off and so this is showing basically the different characteristics of uh, the the scattering uh, critically we can get out here into the state where lambda is uh, much much greater than the size of a dust grain. And so this happens in the infrared for most of our dust grains. And we enter into this Rayleigh scattering regime. Uh, this is also the regime where particles in the atmosphere are operating. So light, you know, is 500 nanometers. Uh, nitrogen molecules, which are doing the scattering, are down there at the one nanometer scale or one uh, angstrom scale, more like. Uh, and so you get orders of magnitude between them. And we enter into this Rayleigh scattering regime. Uh, where there is some absorption and scattering, and you may be familiar if you have suffered through 380. Oh, geez, probably wouldn't even be 381. It'd be 481 here. Um, yeah, 481. You'll probably get. Uh, you will see that you know the wavelength scale or the scattering scales like one over wavelength to the fourth power, but less less featured in our classes is that the absorption scales like one over wavelength squared in this Rayleigh regime. So that's the case where uh, dust is in our light is interacting with dust grains here. And what's neat about this is that this tells us that this, uh, this uh, absorption uh, cross section is dropping off, but it is dropping off in such a way that, uh, you know, we are actually preferentially kind of absorbing relative scattering when we're over here in the Rayleigh regime. Now, what is neat about this is that the absorption properties of an object are very similar to its emission properties. And what happens when we get into uh, this state where the absorption is scaling like one over wavelength squared, that means that the dust grains are not efficient emitters of long wavelength light. And what this means is that we end up with spectra that drop off steeper than black body emission. As you go to long wavelengths, their spectra are actually steeper than what you would expect from thermal emission. Uh, and so what that means is that you can look at the properties of SEDs from galaxies and determine what the properties of dust emission are. So uh, since dust is a relatively poor emitter at long wavelength, that means that you get, when you sort of apply the Stefan Boltzmann law to dust grains, you don't get uh, four pi r squared sigma t to the fourth, you get sigma t to the four plus beta. And that beta is the index of the cross section and in the Rayleigh scatter, uh, the absorption cross section. And in the Rayleigh scattering regime, that Rayleigh cross section uh, index is two. So it, you end up with L goes like uh, T to the sixth uh, for these dust grains. Uh, this has some interesting byproducts that uh, dust grains, uh, as they heat up, they become ultra efficient emitters. Uh, so you end up sort of getting a lot of heat out of this. And so what I want to show you here is the effect, uh, call your attention to this particular spectrum here, which is showing the light from a galaxy with and without dust grains here. Uh, at short wavelengths, what you see is that there is an extinguishing of the light from absorption, and then those dust grains will absorb that light, re-radiate it, and kick it back out into uh, the inter, uh, kick it back out into uh, the infrared. And so this section down here, this is the infrared light. So uh, here is the optical. So this section here is the optical chunk of the spectrum, and then we have the near infrared. But out here at kind of ten. Uh, micron regime, we get a few spectral line features. So these features here are from large molecules, these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that we've uh, discussed a little bit, or, and by we've discussed, I mean, I have mentioned. Um, and then out here, we get these uh, scalings where the uh, uh, radiation is falling off steeper than a black body. So this is a thermal emission spectrum out here, uh, a, or say what we call a modified black body emission spectrum. Uh, so you can actually use this to infer the temperature of the dust grains here. And so you can see a lot of the features of this absorption and scattering in the spectrum of galaxies. And so this is an example of how these dust grains are reprocessing radiation. Wow. 
Okay. Uh, that's what I wanted to say about that. And I said that for way too long. But I get excited about it. Uh, but we can see it uh, manifest in something like this, where we have uh, infrared and optical views of the same galaxies, where uh, if you look, this is uh, galaxy M81, and we have these beautiful sort of dust features along the spiral arms here. And the dust absorption features that you see, like say this structure right here, is very bright in the infrared. So you kind of get an opposite view uh, in the infrared versus the optical. So the optical light is showing you where the stars are, and then you get these dust extinction lanes here uh, in those cases. And then the things, uh, those dust extinction lanes show up over here in infrared emission, because that's where the dust is absorbing light, reprocessing, and heating it back up. All right. Now is a good place to pause. Let's see if there are any questions. All right. So the next case study we want to talk about is the properties of heating and cooling. And I figured that a good place to do a study of heating and cooling was in studying H2 regions. Uh, so H2 regions are, uh, we, we talked about their photoionization process. Okay, can I show the extinction in infrared, the dust extinction in infrared again? Uh, so you're asking about uh, this um, plot here, where we're sort of comparing the infrared and the optical. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so we have these two uh, views of the same galaxy. Do you have a specific question about this? I think the main point I wanted to communicate is where uh, the extinction uh, is blocking out the optical light. We have emission in the infrared. Awesome. Okay. Uh, fantastic. Okay. So this is a change of pace here, um, where we have uh, the temperature in the interstellar medium. And so I wanted to sort of get at what is setting the temperature. I can tell you, if you look back at the chart, that the temperature of an H2 region in the ionized medium, it's 10,000 Kelvin. Why? Why would it be 10,000 Kelvin versus some other temperature? And so this case study is kind of exposing the basic uh, processes that lead to that thermal balance uh, in the interstellar medium. And so the first thing I want to do is focus on what it means for something to have a kinetic energy, a mean kinetic, uh, 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 sorry, a uh, temperature. And what that means is that the uh, mean kinetic energy of the particles is tracked by the temperature. And it uses this microphysical relationship here that you may see in StatMech that a kinetic energy of a particle is three halves kT, uh, and so I can always figure out the relate the temperature and the speed of uh, particles. So uh, we can do this in an example where if I have a um, uh, H2 region with a temperature of 8,000 Kelvin, I can ask how fast are the protons moving on average. And so that just uses this relationship, 1 half mv squared is equal to 3 halves uh, kT. And if I want to figure out V, I get that V is equal to cancel, cancel, uh, 3 kT over M uh, square root. And then I plug in my numbers, uh, 3 times 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin times the temperature of 8,000 Kelvin over the mass of a proton is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27. And I can grind that on out. I ended up leaving my notes at work this morning, which was uh, a stupid thing for a human to do. But that is the nature of the beast. And so we do 3 times 1.38 e minus 23. You don't need to see me doing this. But yeah, that's, that's, good. that's good science right there. 27 all raised to the 0 0.5. And we get that this is... 
Is that right? Yeah. 1.4 times 10 to the 4 meters per second. Yeah, 14 kilometers per second. Seems about right. All right. Uh, I just wanted to do that little setup there because you may see what's coming. Yeah. All right. Any questions? Because we're going to ask how fast are the electrons moving on average? And I guess the question that you should sort of intuitively say is, uh, well, if I know um, the... Uh, hey, where'd my... <sighs> it's not a good day. All right, there we go. Our poll is up and running. Sorry about the delay. Yeah, intuitively you should have a sense of, okay, should they be slower or faster? All right, so let's take a few minutes or a few seconds, plug it in. All right, so one of the exciting, uh, I one of the exciting truisms of uh, physics is that the mass of the proton over the mass of the electron square root is about a factor of forty. So I know that if uh, the protons are traveling at uh, or, uh, fa about 14 kilometers per second, I know that the electrons have to be traveling about 40 times faster than that. And so sure enough, we get an answer that's about uh, 6 times 10 to the uh, fifth um, meters per second, which is 600 kilometers per second is pretty fast. And so, yeah, the intuition that you should have here is that the electrons and the protons in this gas are carrying equal amounts of kinetic energy on a per particle basis. And that means that we necessarily must have um, the, we, uh, we, that necessarily means that the electrons must be traveling faster to make up for the fact that they have lower mass. If you just look at the kinetic energy, of a particle, and it's the same. If the mass m is lower, then the v has to be higher uh, by basically the square root of the mass ratio, 
uh, to put these things into an equipartition of energy. So it's something to remember that the electrons are always traveling faster in H2 regions, and that uh, is interesting uh, because then that means that they are the things that are doing the collisions. How do we do that? All right, any uh, questions on um, uh, what was that happening here? And the occasional point. Yeah, no. Okay. The reason why we care about how the electrons are moving is to look at the uh, uh, cooling mechanisms. So we view the interstellar medium as always kind of in this energetic tug of war between things that heat up the gas and things that cool down the gas. And so the thing that cools down the gas are the emission lines of uh, metals. Uh, so the reason why hydrogen doesn't help to really cool things down is that if I just recombine, uh, the, the, the only way that we're going to actually get uh, sort of photons out of, well, let me take a step back here. So the cooling process is essentially taking kinetic energy in a gas and turning it into photons that can then leave the system. So if something is cooling down, what that means is I'm taking thermal energy out, turning it into some form of energy that leaves the system. So the essentially spectral lines act as the refrigerants. Hydrogen can't do that because if I make spectral lines out of hydrogen, all of that is basically turning from the energy. We only get a little bit of cooling out, I should say, uh, because the only lines that kind of come out are that sort of initial recombination line absorbs kinetic energy. Otherwise, you're basically just exchanging photon energy for photon energy. So we break down uh, some of the high energy photons, but the actual temperature of the gas isn't decreasing except for that initial recombination. So it turns out not to be a lot of thermal energy released. Instead, you have atoms like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, which still have electrons in their uh, H2 regions. They have bound states. Sometimes they're partially ionized, but they still have some electrons bound to them. And that means that they have bound uh, electronic transitions, regular old spectral lines. Uh, so in what we're going to do, we discuss uh, the uh, spectral lines of oxygen, uh, and other species in terms of what we call spectroscopic notation. And so uh, we use this line where, you know, I, I think I've mentioned this before, uh, Roman numerals basically take one away from the Roman numeral and that's the positive ionization state. So if I talk about O3, that's oxygen two. If I talk about O2, that's, uh, sorry, doubly ionized oxygen is O3, O2 is singly ionized oxygen. And the generic cooling process across much of the interstellar medium uh, through ions like this is uh, a electron comes in uh, and it's carrying some kinetic energy. It hits an ion, say this O plus ion, it excites that uh, the an electronic state within the oxygen ion, so we put a little asterisk on it there, and then this kinetic this uh, electron here has lower kinetic energy, and so functionally we've reduced its temperature and it'll go and it'll thermalize with the other electrons and it'll overall bring the temperature of the gas down because we have removed a chunk of kinetic energy, thrown it into the photon and, oh, we haven't actually told you where the photon comes from. The photon comes from this oxygen excited state, then de-exciting, giving off this photon and then this photon is like, wee, I'm out of here and it leaves the system, bam cooling. And so when you look at the spectra of regions with uh, ionized gas around them, you see all of these spectral lines in them here. And most of these are these cooling lines of oxygen and other species. Uh, there's a lot of nitrogen lines in the optical chunk of the spectrum. And then carbon, for some reason, always ends up in the infrared and the ultraviolet. Uh, so that's where the carbon cooling lines are. 
So to understand cooling, we have to look at my poorly drawn models of the energy levels of oxygen two and three states. Uh, these are, you don't have to know the details of these. I just kind of want to show you the internal states that are being excited uh, in these. And note that, when, so we have electrons will come in and they will take a, uh, or sorry, an electron will come in, it will hit an oxygen ion hanging out in a ground state, and then that will knock the electron up to a uh, excited state and then it will then de-excite and give off a photon with the indicated wavelength, you know, 372.9 nanometers. And then you can go back here and say, ah, 372.9, there's, those are the oxygen complex right there, uh, gives you those lines. Uh, some show up in the ultraviolet, some show up in the near infrared, but what's happening is electron comes in, kicks everything up, and then uh, it drops down and the photon leaves the system. Uh, because there's nothing in there to absorb or interact with it. Uh, the oxygen three line, uh, uh, oxygen three lines also have uh, in these ground state infrared transitions uh, that give uh, that are readily excited and do a lot of cooling uh, that way. All of these things sort of look in like uh, we we parameterize them in the same uh, kind of functional form, which is we use a uh, cooling rate, which is basically the power radiated per unit volume in a region, and that is given by some constant which represents the whole physics of everything, times the density of the colliders times the density of the targets. And we saw a bit of these kind of two body systems in recombination, where you basically depend on the density of electrons and the density of the protons. Anything that's like a two body interaction, it's gonna scale like the density squared. And then this uh, cooling coefficient essentially is the energy carried by the photon that's coming out. And then we have some sort of uh, cross section uh, reaction rate. And so practically what this means, you've seen this, this is in the dust um, model. We saw a similar term here. This is essentially, if you look at this dimensionality, sigma is the cross section of a dust, uh, of a, uh, uh, in this case, oxygen molecule, and then oxygen ion. And then the V is the speed of uh, the electrons. And so functionally, what this kind of looks like is a cylinder here, where this cross-sectional area is sigma, and then V uh, times some unit of time gives you a volume. So this is basically the volume swept out by a oxygen ion sweeping through a cloud of electrons uh, at a speed V. Of course, the electrons are moving and not the oxygen ion, but you can sort of think of that. And that basically gives you this coefficient that ends up being units of energy uh, times volume per unit time. Uh, that's here. And so all of these uh, coefficients are going to have a, uh, uh, lambdas are going to have units of basically watts times a volume, watts meter cubed. And then you multiply by two powers of density and you end up with the cooling term that you're expecting here. Now that lambda is a big mess. Uh, there's a lot of cross-section physics embedded in this, and they all have the same general form where you have some coefficient that depends on uh, physical parameters, and then you get a one over root temperature e to the negative delta e over kt, where delta e is the energy of excitation for that. And then you have something, and that something deals with all of the quantum mechanics of how electrons hit ions. And that something, that big omega, has a lot of weird structure as you go through. This is functionally energy down here. Uh, and as you sort of sweep through the kind of uh, different uh, energy uh, states here, you get these long resonant structures. And so what you do is you say, all right, um, physicists in the 1960s who didn't have nearly as awesome quantum mechanics or nanotechnology to deal with, why don't you grind out a bunch of ion uh, electron interaction uh, calculations, figure out what these graphs are, average over them, and tell me a number. And the physicists in the 1960s, they totally got your back and they hand off numbers uh, to you. 
And so what this means is that we have these beautifully parameterized heating and cooling rates for the interstellar medium, all of which have the same form. And what you need to know is that they generally all fall into this form where lambda is a big mess of physical coefficients times the density squared, and that the dependence on uh, lambda tends to follow this e to the negative delta e over kt over root t dependency. And that'll give me the basic nature of those cooling curves. And then the graph over here shows cooling curves as a function of temperature. Since I've run out of time, I'll come right back to this slide on Wednesday and kind of recap it here. But I just kind of want to finish the thought of where these cooling terms are coming from. All right. Uh, thank you very much. I will see you on Wednesday.